Hello, cruel, cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. You can call me the ominous Shahominus now. This video is going to address some common stereotypes about English people. What is fact versus what is fiction? And I'm also going to be answering some interesting questions such as who goes to therapy more? People in the UK or the USA and who takes antidepressants more? UK versus USA. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, ominous shahominous, you're a, a renowned criminal psychiatrist and you make really entertaining and educational videos about mental illness and about crime. Why are you making this video? And I would reply, I'm a mediocre psychiatrist at best. My videos are about average. Some of my jokes are a bit desperate and a bit jarring and I keep slagging off Dr. Grande, obviously obsessed with him. There is some psychology and emotional content in this video, and I checked with the gods of psychology, namely Frazier, Jordan Peterson, and the ghost of Sigmund Freud, and they all said that it's okay. So some of these stereotypes I'm going to either dispel or I'm actually going to prove with actual hard statistics, and some of it is from my own personal experience. If I was a show-off and if I wanted to try and sound clever and scientific, I would say that some of it is qualitative and some of it is quantitative, but I'm not, so I won't. But anyway, let's get started. Cue the introduction. Myth number one stereotype about English people is that they have a stiff upper lip. So it refers to a perceived characteristic of British people, particularly English people. What does that mean, a stiff upper lip? Well, not only does it help us with trimming our moustaches, but it describes somebody who maintains composure and emotional control in a difficult or stressful situation. And it avoids openly expressing strong emotions like sadness, anger, or fear. And a stiff upper lip is also about stoicism, so stoically enduring hardships or pain without complaining. So the image of somebody with a stiff upper lip is often somebody who's like got this determined kind of expression on their face, perhaps even a slight smile in the face of adversity, in the face of challenges. So see, this is kind of a video about emotions and mental health if you, you know, squint your eyes and put your fingers in your ears. So the, con the concept of having a stiff upper lip emerged during the Victorian era, so I'm talking about the 1800s, when social norms emphasised emotional restraint and public displays of strength. And also this, the British stiff upper lip is linked to the British Empire, where maintaining a strong and unyielding appearance was seen as important on the world stage. But is it actually true? Well, unlike your face, I think we need to examine it a bit more systematically. Let's talk about therapy. So therapy is on the rise in the UK. A 2022 study by the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy, known as the BACPA, revealed that more than 28% of people in England have consulted a counsellor or a psychotherapist at some point in their lives, which is actually a significant increase from a decade earlier, which was around 20%. But there is also a gender gap that we have to take into consideration. So around 39% of referrals to the National Health Service, the NHS, the nurse, for talking therapies in 2022 were for men and 61% were for women. By the way, chickity check out my video about five myths about men's mental illness, illness, always be plugging. I'll put the link in the description. <clears throat> in that video about men's mental illness, some of the myths I dispel were sh so shocking, it will make you shit in your cereal. Not really, I'm just saying that for dramatic effect. Okay, in comparison, a 2021 survey by the American Psychological Association, the APA, suggests that around 30% of American adults have been to therapy. Now, you guys probably can't get your pea-brained heads around this, but as a man of Indian origin, I'm far superior in maths to you, and I can confirm that 30% and 28% are not too dissimilar. So what I'm saying is that for the UK versus the US, the therapy rates are pretty much the same. So that begs the question, what about antidepressants? What are the statistics on antidepressant use? Well, in England, the NHS, the nurse, dispensed over 86 million antidepressants in 2022 to 2023 to an estimated 8.6 million identified patients. So that equates to around 14.7% of the population receiving at least one antidepressant prescription. So actually, oddly, contrary to popular belief, the breakdown of stats seems to say that there's more of a, a higher rate of antidepressant use 
in the UK compared to the USA. <clears throat> because the USA, based on the most recent data from 2015 to 2018, says that 13.2% of adults aged 18 or over used antidepressants in the last 30 days. So that's 13.2 compared to 14.7. Although I have to say that the US stat is for the last 30 days, whereas the UK stat is over the last year, which is obviously going to be higher. Those are the only stats I could find to compare. I'm sorry. So what does all of this mean? What am I trying to say? If a stiff upper lip equates to acknowledging your own emotional issues and seeking treatment, which it definitely does, I double checked, there's actually very little difference between the UK and the USA proportionally. I must admit, I am a bit surprised by these results. This is what my research has shown, but that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm ousting myths. I'm dispelling lies. I'm breaking wind. I'm breaking boundaries. But those are the statistics that I quoted to you. As any good scientist knows, you should ignore statistics if you prefer to rely on personal anecdotes. So I'm a psychiatrist. What's my clinical experience? Honestly, <clears throat> so I deal with criminal psychiatry, but I also do civil court cases, which is more about sort of trauma, uh, people suing people for clinical negligence, etc. From my experience, it's more generational than anything else. So what I'm saying is, roughly speaking, I'd say people over 50 that I assess I would say have a stiff upper lip. They don't really talk about their emotions. They're a little insightless and they're a little reluctant to complain about their mood issues, for example, whereas people who are younger are very more open to it. So I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's all about ages. Okay, especially men, by the way. So men are, as you would expect, more stoic. Again, go chickadee, check out my video about that. <clears throat> okay, myth number two about English people, they are polite and well-mannered. So the myth is, or the stereotype I should say, is that they're often seen as using phrases like please and thank you frequently and queuing up in lines in particular patiently. However, it sh I should say that English people tend to be perceived by some foreigners as being more indirect in their communication than some cultures. So it's not actually politeness, it's kind of seen or, or it's interpreted fairly or unfairly as an aloofness or a lack of warmth. So what about this myth of being politeness? I think it varies within the within England itself. So politeness can vary in regionality. So for example, Southern England is known, not necessarily for being ruder, but being for more reserved in its politeness, whereas some areas in the North might be more direct and might be more friendly. So I live in London and it's obviously a very busy city, especially in central London and especially on the Tube. And I've got to say, I don't think people are particularly polite. So not just polite and saying please and thank you, but in their interactions, in terms of interacting with strangers. So in the North, you might make random polite conversation with somebody in the pub or somebody in a bus. In London, if you speak to a stranger, you could actually get sectioned for that. So tell me, a psych for sore guys, in your experience, am I being truthful about London? Am I being harsh? Let me know in the Shmomit Shmection below. I'm going to say something that's slightly controversial, but I believe it to be true. London is obviously very multicultural, and in my humble opinion, certain ethnicities, I don't think they're intentionally being rude, but it's not in their makeup to use niceties. Etiquette is not uh, entwined in their cultural DNA. So I know what you're thinking, Dr. Das, which ethnicities are you talking about? And my reply is, no thanks, I don't want to get cancelled, so whichever ones you think I'm talking about, that's probably the one that you're talking about, that I'm talking about, whoever's talking about. Uh, just as another very brief sort of example of politeness niceties London versus other places uh, I go jogging in my local park in London obviously it's a park so it's not particularly it's not the tube it's not built up nobody ever bet you would you lucky if you get eye contact if you run past another jogger they certainly wouldn't smile at you they would definitely not say hello again everyone would think they were weird if they did that I've also been jogging uh, where my parents used to live in High Wycombe every single person that you passed, every single person would smile and say hello that you jogged past. So I'm just giving you a kind of, a, a trying to make the point that it's, it's very variable in different areas of the UK, especially London. I also think that social class is very much connected to politeness. Social economic factors can influence them. I think there's a correlation between the higher classes and formal speech patterns in England. There's even some sort of debate and humor surrounding the concept of British politeness. Some find it charming and endearing. Other, other people see it as being overly indirect and even passive aggressive. So for example, English politeness is often expressed through indirect communications. So you can soften criticism like saying, I, want, I was wondering if, or using humor to avoid confrontation. So I'll give you a specific example. Whereas an American might say, hey buddy, I want a refund on this burger. It tastes like dog shit. 
An English person is much more likely to say, excuse me, old chap, I was wondering if one might consider a refund on this burger I purchased. Its flavours are reminiscent of canine feculent matter. Okay, moving on. Stereotype number three. English people are obsessed with a weather. There's a perception that they talk about English, English people talk about weather excessively, perhaps due to it's constantly changing. Oddly, I know this might surprise some of our foreign viewers, I actually think this is true. I, I really do, even though it is banal, prosaic, facile, inane, cursory, trite, you're goddamn right, I do have an awesome synonym game. I think it's fair to say, and I think I've proven that my vocabulary is not only good, but it's also great. I do think British people talk about the weather excessively. I don't know what that's about. So, you know, in my uh, attempt at media work, I'm always on Zoom calls with a number of people, producers, podcasters, blah, blah, blah. And loads of people start off by talking about the weather for a good couple of minutes. And it's completely unnecessary. It's boring. And it is... I don't know, just slightly awkward than being polite, but it actually happens all the time, in my humble opinion. Let me know, am I being accurate or not in the schmoment schmection below. Okay, I'm gonna tell you some random statistics about English people. So the population of England is estimated to be about 56.3 million people. Uh, now, the population of the UK, the United Kingdom, or Britain is estimated to be about 68 million people. So, for those that don't know, the UK is not just England, it's also made up of Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Forgive me for stating the obvious, I know that you know, but I'm letting other people, like our foreign viewers, who might be ignorant about other nations, know. By which I mean American people. <clears throat> Okay, so random stat number one about English people. England is a nation of animal lovers. Cats and dogs, obviously, are the most common pets, with around 8.4 million homes owning cats and 8.9 million homes owning dogs, respectively, in England. Random stat number two about England is that pubs are still considered an important social space. There are around 40,000 pubs around the country, but shockingly and slightly worryingly, about 3.9 thousand pubs are closing their doors every year in England. So by my calculations, that is not looking good. It means in about 10 years, we'll all be sitting outside in the park drinking, just like you did when you were 17 years old and you had a fake ID with your wispy beard, but nobody believed it and the bouncers wouldn't let you in despite all your friends. Don't think I don't know, because I know. Random stat number three about English people in England is that employees in England are entitled to a minimum of 28 days of paid holiday per year. It, some employers might say that includes bank holidays, it's up to them, which is much higher than North America. The US federal mandate actually has nothing for paid holidays. So technically it's, it's, it's legal for employers in the state to not offer their employees any holiday at all, which is crazy to me. If you're in this, from the States, by the way, we say holiday, not vaca vacation, but don't worry about it, you're not getting any of it anyway. So how does England compare to other nations? Well, Canada mandates a minimum of 10 days of vacation after one year of employment, so we're doing better than them. Many countries across Europe offer more generous statutory minimums. For instance, Austria, get down, mandates 30 days. And France, Monsieur Doucement, c'est n'est pas vrai, offers a minimum of 30 days vacation, excluding public holidays. So <clears throat> the English employers can count bank holidays within their 28 days, whereas Austria, France don't count that. Okay, fourth random fact about England and English people is that it is the land of literature. England has some rich lit literary heritage, boasting famous authors like J.K. Rowling, like William Shakespeare, Jane Austen, like the ominous Shahomanus, and many more. Interestingly, for a statistic about England, the average English adult reads about six books per year. Before you ask, yes, Harry Potter does count, and no, the last book that you read doesn't count. I don't care how hungry that caterpillar was. Okay, another random stat about English people, and this is about castles. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, an English man's gnome is his castle. These are historical landmarks and the major tourist attractions and a source of national pride. A site for sore guys, can you guess how many castles there are in England? Answer later on this episode. It is actually shocking, and I'm not just saying that because I'm hoping that you'll keep watching to the end of the video, although I am. It's genuinely astounding. It's much, much higher than I expected. I even can't believe it's true, but I've seen it from many, many sources. Okay, myth stereotype number four about English people is that we are obsessed with American culture. 
I think this is probably true. I mean, I've already mentioned America several times in comments in this very video. Um, for Americans watching, you might be interested to know that your music, particularly rock, pop, hip hop, R&B, is hugely popular in the UK. American artists like Michael Jackson, <laughs> Madonna, Nirvana, Beyonce, all have a massive following in Britain. Even R. Kelly, around the time of Remix to Ignition, before the unnecessary and frankly impolite mixturation. I said mixturation, if you don't know what that means, look it up. It's the freaking weekend about to have me some fun. Well, I think we have very different, different definitions of fun. I think there's a bit much R. Kelly, or R. Kelly, as it'd be called here. Movies and television. So Hollywood films, American television shows are hugely popular around the world. UK is no exception from blockbusters like Star Wars or your Marvel movies to classic sitcoms like Friends, Simpsons, all of that stuff's good over here. Um, American productions are a staple of British entertainment. I think it's happening to a degree the other way around. You've, you've adopted some of our TV shows, you've tried to remake them. Don't mean to be rude, but I don't think you've done a great job. So you've butchered the in-betweeners. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. And even the US office. I'm, I'm gonna, I know I'm saying it's controversial because I know it's very popular, especially in the States, but I don't rate it. I think it's just bland. I think the US office, the, the writing is very basic. I think the essence of the office, the UK office, and what makes it so good is that it's relatable. All the characters are caricatured versions and twisted versions of real life people that you actually meet. We've all worked in offices or in jobs with people like this. Whereas in my view, the US office characters are just implausible, they're, they're too unrealistic. I'm sorry, I just don't think it's funny. So I'm gonna go out on a lamb and I'm gonna call a shovel a shovel. Sorry fam, it's no good. Fast food. Whereas the UK has its own fast food chains, American chains like McDonald's, KFC, Burger King, all very popular in Britain, in the UK, in England. There's more on bland English cuisine later on in this video. Languages. So the UK tends to embrace and copy some American words and phrases and they kind of become part of our vernacular and they become trendy. Personally, I think when English people use American phrases that we haven't adopted, I think it just comes across as a bit desperate. I don't know about y'all. So here are some examples of recent American words that we've adopted. Busted, which means caught or in trouble. Salty, which describes somebody who is bitter, angry or upset. Extra, means somebody being overly dramatic or attention seeking. And skeet, which I believe has something to do with ice skating, I'm not sure. Having said all of that, I do think that foreign influences are changing in England and in the UK, probably in the, in the world actually, not just UK. We're more open to art and influence. So for example, in recent years, we've come to respect Korean films and programs like Squid Game, like Parasite. We're aware of Italian wine. We're aware of French body odor. And actually, I recently had a look in an atlas and turns out there's loads of other countries out there. Myth. Stereotype number five about English people is a linguistic diversity. I think a lot of people, a lot of foreigners, especially Americans, think that we all talk posh. They see fictional characters like James Bond, they see Mr. Darcy from Pride and Prejudice, or they see characters played by actors like Hugh Grant or Schmenedict Nunderdach, sorry, Henedict Rungusmatch, sorry, Spenedict Nunderdach, or Danny Dyer, who embody these posh traits and these posh language and speaking that they think that we're all like that but actually as all english people will know there are lots of regional dialects uh, within england itself so this includes dialects like cockney people who come from london 10 pound for a pint you're having a monkey ain't you they include scouse people who come from liverpool all right calm down there's no point getting in a hassle they include scottish people there's been a murder they in include people from Manchester. All right, you're coming down Manchester for a burger. And they include Geordie people, people who come from Newcastle. Who oh, I pick? Let's gun down town for a kebab lake. And by the way, I ken Scotland ain't in England, you wee prick. I just like doing the accent, and I think we both agree I'm shite at it. Anyway, moving on. Myth number six, stereotype, is that English people have bad teeth. Okay, let's put an end to this argument. I've even looked up statistics for all y'all. The NHS nurse dental checkups. According to a, new, a 2019, the nurse report indicated that 55% of adults in England have had an NHS dental examination in the past two years. Obviously, checkups don't always translate to cleaning or dental surgery. 
Um, but the USA, the American Dental Association, the ADA, recommends dental checkups and cleanings every six months. And a survey suggests by the CDC, a 2020 survey suggests that 65.3% of adults in the United States visited the dentist in the past year. So, okay, I, I concede that statistically it suggests a higher overall rate of dental visits in the USA compared to the UK. You do beat us there, but I genuinely don't think that people in the UK have bad teeth. Speaking of teeth, I think a famous philosopher, I believe it was Socrates, said, this is my favourite song, sing along when the DJ throws it on, and if he leave here tonight and I, and I fall asleep and wake up, boop, hopefully she got some teeth. I generally don't think that English people have bad dentition. At a push, you could say that in very deprived areas, they might have really bad teeth. So actually, seriously speaking, I when I was a junior psychiatrist, I worked in a drug and alcohol service somewhere in, in Holloway in central London. And most of the clients here had terrible teeth. There are people on methadone, there were crack addicts. I don't think hygiene was a high priority. And also methadone kind of rots your teeth, turns them into this green uh, kind of colour. So what I'm saying is there are pockets in England that have bad teeth. But I reckon that's more to do with poverty than anything else. And I imagine it's the same in the USA. I don't know for a fact, because oddly I've not been to the States going around the hood asking to look at people's teeth because I'd not like to get shot, thank you. But any American viewers, is this true? Is it fair to say that, that your poor people have worse teeth? If so, let me know in the Schwammish section below. That is a sentence I never thought I'd ever say as a psychiatrist. Anyway, it's almost there. There's only a couple more myths to do. We can do it. You can do it, get your back into it. We can do it, get your ass into it. Myth stereotype number seven about English people is that we have bland and boring food. <sighs> Before we get into that, I just wanna very briefly introduce you to this channel, Schmeich for Small Minds. I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered uh, offenders in prisons and in courts and psychiatric units. I make a smorgasbord of videos related to mental health and offending and the crossover betwixt the two. I've recently been doing these myths. I've done myths about men's mental health, about women's prisons, about psychopaths. Go chiggity chiggity check them out. I implore you to subscribe. Not only does it help me out immensely, but if you do, you'll never stand in dog doo doo ever again. Guaranteed all your money back. I don't want to see your creps get dirty. Okay, back to the video. Myth number seven, English food is bland and boring. Is that true? Well, I think it's seen by some as lacking variety and excitement. And I know I'm putting myself in mortal danger here, but I have to say, I actually agree. I mean, what is English food? A roast. A roast sucks, fam. All right, Yorkshire puddings. I'll give you Yorkshire puddings. You can have that. Yorkshire puddings are nice, right? But the rest of it, lumpy, salty, gravy, dry meat, tasteless, it's insipid. It's horrible. It's not really a problem if you live in the UK because there's so much availability of other food. Obviously, it depends where you live. I live in London. I can honestly say within 10 minutes drive, if you count all fast, all food outlets, including fast food restaurants and restaurants, supermarkets, whatever, there's easily, well, not supermarkets, but the other places, there's easily 30 places within 10 minutes drive that serve food. If I go for 30 minute drive, there's probably hundreds of places around me. So it's not that there isn't food available, but it's just, I think that English food is actually quite bland. I'm not even fond of fish and chips. I think it's all too greasy. Okay, come on, we're almost there. Myth number eight of English people and, um, and stereotypes about England in general is a love of drinking tea, particularly black tea, sometimes a milk, perhaps sugar. It's a quintessential English habit, but is it true? Well, I've looked this up for you. On average, English people consume about 160 cups of tea per person per year, which is actually not a lot. It equates to, I don't know, roughly 0.4384 cups of tea per person per day, which is not, not a lot, it's not even half a cup of tea. From my experience, and I know this is limited, workmen oddly seem to really like their tea, but most other people, I think, prefer coffee. Again, maybe it's London, there's a, there's a cafe culture here, but I don't think that myth is true. Okay, before we finish, I asked you a cash question. I asked you a question, my shite for sure guys and gals, which is how many castles are there in the UK? I know this sounds like bullshit, I know it sounds like making up, but I promise you this is true in so much as my research has shown. There are, what did you guess? 10,000 castles in the UK. That blows my mind. If you got within, say 10%, buy yourself a cookie and send me a bill. If you got within 1%, then buy yourself a Tesla and bill Dr. Grande. So there are lots. Okay, 
To finish, let's summarize what we learned, kids. We learned that Americans and English people roughly have the same proportion in terms of therapy and antidepressants. We learned that people in London are rude. We learned that I'm excellent, flawless at accents. We learned that English food is bland, but our teeth is fine. And if you disagree with any of that, if you think I'm being insulting to the UK, if you think I'm perpetuating any negative stereotypes, just keep a stiff upper lip, old chap. Okay, it's time for me to bounce. Buy my goddamn book. Have a blessed day. And do not forget. Do not forget. I love you.